As a courtesy during this service, uh, will you be kind enough just to switch off any digital devices? So if you've got a mobile phone or something else that might make a bit of noise, if you can switch that off now, please, that would be appreciated. Well, welcome everyone this morning to this service where we farewell a really special woman, Marie Lorraine Bent, on a really special day because today is Marie's late husband Rex's birthday. He would have been 85 years old today. So Rex passed away in 2017 and the funeral has been delayed uh, so they could actually be held on this day. Uh, on behalf of the church family here in Connect Church, we offer our most sincere sympathies to the, uh, to the Bennett family, uh, to Mari's two very special daughters, uh, Julie and Raylene, uh, who she would literally, we all know, she would literally do anything for them. She was literally their rock. Uh, and I mention out of respect, uh, out of respect, uh, Renwick, a, a stillborn baby brother to Julie and Raylene. We also remember Mari's siblings. She was one of uh, six girls. She was number four. I, I hope my numbers are right. So uh, Margie, Jessie, Dorothy and Betty, uh, sadly they're all deceased and we sympathise today with Teddy who, who, is, who is with us, so younger sister. Uh, Mari leaves behind plenty of grieving family and friends. I know the family personally, uh, as Mari actually came uh, to this church, so I've known her for many years, and uh, the church family are grieving her loss as well as the immediate family and extended friends, network of friends. So what do we do during this farewell service today? We do two things. The first thing we do is we, we give thanks for Mari's life, uh, and we want to celebrate Mari's legacy as well. I had the the joy of sharing a few cuppies with Mari, and it was pretty apparent to me that she was, a, she was just a, a delightful character. Uh, she knew and she loved God. Uh, she read and she reflected on the Bible. She even hosted a Bible study group in her home. So she, re she really did love the Lord. But her Christian character, I reckon, was most exemplified by her unselfish, and by her very contented nature. She was also a great conversationalist and uh, could chat to almost anyone. I reckon she could talk the wheel off a car. Uh, she had a really cheeky and humorous streak, not dissimilar to Rex. Uh, she really loved the cuppers. She loved reading. She loved the gardening. I reckon she had some of the nicest, most stunning roses in all of Grafton. Uh, she loved her cooking and she made a delightful sponge cake. Uh, and back in the day, I'm led to believe she actually enjoyed uh, dancing and playing tennis as well. So, look, she especially loved her beloved Rexy and her girls, and uh, she gave them all much guidance and help and wisdom, and uh, no doubt the eulogy will elaborate a fair bit more on all of that. That's the first thing we do today. The second thing we do today is we're going to look uh, pretty briefly at the Bible, at God's Word, uh, which is going to give us some pretty stirring reminders of, of eternal life and what that all means. So we're at a point now where it's fitting that we pray together. And a close family friend uh, from Tamworth, Jim Furs, is going to pray. So thank you, Jim. And, and thank you for the invitation of allowing me to come. Ooh, I have this problem in most places. So let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, some people come into our lives and quickly go, while others stay and leave footprints on our hearts. And we are never the same. We thank you, O oh God, for your love and deep desire to be with us. We thank you for the love of Mari and the special memories we have of her for all of us. We remember with fondness the way Mari touched our lives. We celebrate and give thanks to you, Father, 
for her life as we remember her and the things she has contributed to our lives. Your word, Lord, tells us that you are always listening to us when we talk to you. You promise never to ignore us or turn your back on us. But please, Lord, please listen to us now as we come to terms with our feelings this day. Help us and guide us to be discerning. Give us the wisdom and courage to know the difference between those feelings which are good and those that leave us in places filled with grief and sorrow. Help us to know the warmth of your care and forgiveness when memories consume us. Gather us up in your loving hands. Surround us with your comfort and compassion. Help us to understand. Help us to come to terms with the past. Help us, Lord, to forgive past hurts. Help us to remember the joys. Help us to love. Amen. We're going to watch and listen to a video now of a beautiful hymn that Mari deeply appreciated. It's the hymn Amazing Grace. Just encourage you to sit back and reflect on the, the wonderful love and grace that God shows to us. Now, feel free to hum along, even feel free to sing along, because most of you will know these words. Here we go, Amazing Grace.
We're now going to hear some memories of Mari's life. Um, this is going to happen in sort of, I think, three parts. So uh, Julie, Mari's uh, eldest daughter, is going to share first, I think. And then Raylene, Mari's youngest daughter, is going to share second. And then I think, um, yeah, Helen Donovan is going to share something after that. So Julie, if you want to come up, and it's going to be pretty tough for her, I reckon. brave to share a eulogy at your mother's funeral. is a celebration of my mum's life. A life that, that, that she loved. Raylene and I have been very humbled by all the messages we receive sa saying what a beautiful, lovely lady she was always laughing, with big bear hugs, a huge smile and a yarn to tell. Every one of us will carry a special place of Mari in our hearts because she has left a mark on us all. Mum was the fourth daughter of six girls, born on the 12th of October 1933 to William McQueen and Janet Elizabeth Louise Laurie. She grew up on the family farm at Lower Kangaroo Creek where her youngest sister Teddy still resides. She had a loving carefree childhood and always said she never went without a feed. She used to tell us about all the mischief she used to get up to. They all had lots of chores to do, and one of mum's was to dig a hole and bury the toilet pan. One day, one day after she and her sister Betty had completed the job, she asked her little sister Teddy to jump on it to see if it was set. You could guess what happened next. Teddy was bogged up to her waist, much to the delight of Mum. <laughs> Mum was a very good horsewoman and liked nothing better than to get on her father's young horses with just the stirrups wrapped around her ankles. And the more the horses bucked, the better she liked it. In later life, she used to blame all her aches and pains from having too many busters of horses. Auntie Ted says that Mum was very good at embroidery when she was growing up and used to sit under the kerosene light at night and embroider for many hours. 
I wonder whether eyes trouble started from this. When mum left the farm, she went nursing as a midwife at Runningmead in Grafton, where she met and made many lifetime friends. Again, she was up to her tricks and shenanigans, like the time she and a workmate dressed up as a pregnant couple and presented themselves at the back door of Runningmead and carried on as if they were about to have a baby. It scared the life out of the little ward maid working on her own during the night. In the early 1970s, the family moved back. No. It was during this time at Running Me that Mum's true love came to the forefront when she met Dad, sometimes in 1956. They met at a dance held at the barn in Grafton. Mum was on the other side of the room and Dad walked in, looked across and saw Mum and said, I'm going to marry that woman. Mum told us, of a tall, olive-complexioned, handsome man standing by her side. They danced all night together and walked back to running me that night, hand in hand, and he asked her to marry him. They were married on the 30th of March, 1957, in this church and celebrated their 60th anniversary five years ago. As newlyweds, they moved to Werris Creek and began married life, building a foundation of honesty, loyalty and trust with the greatest of all love, with the addition of their children, Julie Louise, Randrick's deceased and Raylene. It was at Werris Creek that showed her true self. A tribute to Mum this week from a lifelong friend, Barbara F Phillips, summed it up well. Barbara wrote that Mari will be remembered for her wonderful sense of humour, her kindness, compassion, hospitality and generosity. She worked wholeheartedly in the fundraising efforts towards the construction of the Werris Creek swimming pool and continued through to the Werris Creek Swimming Club. She was a member of the Werris Creek Public School Mothers Club, the Bowling and Tennis Clubs. She loved her tennis and was a faithful member of St Andrew's Church. Raylene and I have vivid memories of the many sponge cakes that she was famous for, being donated for raffles and street stall or gifted to others. She was a keen swimmer but could never dive until one day she decided she wanted to learn how. She attempted to dive in but went straight to the bottom of the pool and hit her face, breaking her nose. From that day on, she always said she had a big nose from trying to learn to dive. Tennis was a huge part of her life at Werris Creek and she'd played seven days a week if she could and she was heavily involved in junior tennis as well. We remember one night when Dad came home from work and asked, what's for tea, Louie? To which Mum replied, tennis balls on tennis rackets. <laughs> Mum and Dad were very keen cancers they, they can count more blah, 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 and love dances and love socialising and travelled the country ball circuit where they were often judged bow and ball, bell and bow of the ball. They enjoyed these special times and made many friends. In the early 1970s, 
the family moved back to Grafton and the second chapter began. Mum's first job on her return was at the local prawn factory where she learnt to become the fastest prawn peeler you ever went to see, regardless of the size of the prawns, and she still did that at Christmas time. She left the factory and commenced work at the Grafton Nursing Home in 1973 as a woodsmaid and did the usual new nursing duties. In 1977, she was asked to do the cooking, which she said was the best move she ever made. Again, she was known to get up to mischief and shenanigans, many of which in today's world would probably find her sacked. She made many lifelong friendships with her workmates and she really loved all the residents and their families. Every meal was made fresh from scratch and cooked with love and no one went without. Christmas was always huge at the nursing home and mum's puddings would be seen hanging around everywhere. Christmas lunch was cooked for everyone residents, families, visitors and staff, often for over 70 people. There were many challenges and experiences and funny things happened. One flood time, the bread hadn't arrived from the railway station for breakfast. It used to come across by train where there was a flood. She had plenty of flour, she made up batches of fried scones served with butter and golden syrup and the dear old residents just loved them and they all hoped there would be another flood the next week so they could have fried scones for breakfast again. After 37 years, Mum retired but continued to cook and entertain from her home at 88 Cambridge Street with many cups of tea and social times. She also became involved in the garden club. Raylene and I would like to sincerely thank everyone all of you have supported and cared for Mum over the last five years since Dad passed away. <sighs> Mum loved her garden. She loved cooking. She loved eating especially go to the races for a feed. She loved talking on the phone. She loved horse racing. She loved the football, even though she was the Broncos. She loved the test cricket. She loved music and dancing. She loved talkback radio stations. She loved movies. She loved sitting on the veranda many idle times and she'd be caught asleep on the veranda with her mouth wide open. She loved the challenge. She loved the debate. She loved reading. She loved to know what was going on. She just loved people. She loved all little kids. She had a deep faith and she loved God. She especially loved us and her family and all her extended family and friends and always kept in touch. Mum, Murray, just loved life. And she always said, make the best of each day and don't go to bed angry. Louis, Auntie Murray, Ma, Benny, Murray, Mama. We know you will always be with us every step of the way until we meet again. We love you.
simply could not be. As long as I'm living, I'll carry you with me. Safety tucked within my heart, your light will always shine. A growing mumba never still. Throughout the end of the time, no matter what the future brings, oh, what may lay ahead, I know that you'll always walk with me. Along the path I tread, so rest my angel, be at peace, and let your soul fly free. One day I'll join your glorious flight for your eternity. <laughs> Love you, Mum. Oh, look after Julie, I promise. I'll do everything what you told me to. I only just wish that I moved in, the, in earlier to look after your Mum, but you always said that we've got to live our own lives, and that's what I did. But I went home with a crook leg in October and I didn't return, so I stayed with Mum. Love you, Mum. There's lots of uh, cousins, Aunty Mari's nephews and nieces uh, who've made a big effort to be here today and there's one nephew that couldn't make it, David Child, and he has written some memories that I'm going to read. Julie and Raylene, my memories of your mum. Who could ever forget the bear hugs? The way she always had the biggest smile and made you feel as though you were the only person in the room at that time. And even when as adults, we experienced the same feeling. And oh, what about the sponge cakes? Apparently my mum was a tiny bit jealous of your mum's sponge cakes. She said to us as kids once in a joking way, now Auntie Mari's cakes aren't like the ones I make, so when you go outside to eat it, don't stand in the breeze or the cake will fly off the plate. <laughs> I didn't get her meaning until a long time after. Your mum would put herself out and take on many challenges that perhaps others would back away from. One instance was when she volunteered to look at someone's talking lorikeet. I mean, now that's not something that just anyone can do. Many years ago, I visited one of the nursing homes and both your mum and Auntie Teddy worked there. I recall going to the back door and looking at some of the amazing food that was prepared. It was either someone's birthday or anniversary. I remember thinking at the time what an awesome team they made. Your mum was a no-fuss person that always thought of how she could help others, especially older ones. And I credit in some way, that's why I've spent the best part of 20 years in aged care. So Julian Raleigh, that is just some of my many memories that I have of your mum. So Annie Mari, thank you for the memories. I hope your celebration of mum's life will be something you'll remember indefinitely. Your cousin, David Child. And I just um, like to say, on behalf of Ray and I, I just like to say that Aunty Mari has been Aunty Mari for me all my life. But for the last 26 years, she's also been Aunty Mari to every single staff member that has worked for Ray and I 
at our office next door to her in Cambridge Street. She has also been Aunty Mari to many of our clients and she got to know them all so well and each one called her Aunty Mari. And although many things have changed and will continue to change, the memories remain the same. So I would just like to say thank you, Aunty Mari, for being such a big part of our journey and for always taking a special interest in our life and for always loving our kids and our grandkids. Fly high. God bless. Just one last brief memory. This is from Mick and Chris Bennett. Mari was a loving wife and mother to her husband and daughters. Uh, she was deeply loved by all her in-laws. Her infectious smile, laugh and naughty sense of humour made Mari the essence of sunshine. You will be sadly missed, but never forgotten. Rest in peace, lovely lady. Uh, we're going to be entertained now by a slideshow, so some picture memories from the life of Mari. So sit back and enjoy these beautiful memories.
specifically to this. Anyone here who believes what I, Jesus, am saying right now and aligns himself with the Father, who has in fact put me in charge, has at this very moment the real, lasting life and is no uh, longer condemned to be an outsider. This person has taken a giant step for, from, the, from the world of the dead to the world of the living. I want to ask the question, uh, do you want eternal life? Uh, a wise man once said the statistics on physical death are quite impressive. One out of one people die. Now, in light of the certainty of physical death, you would think that everyone, everyone would be very serious and proactive in considering what lies beyond death. And yet many people just push it out of their minds and focus on other things that really won't matter on the day that they actually die. Like, this is kind of comical, but serious at the same time. Some English criminals back in the 1800s uh, in England um, were being carried on the back of a cart, led by a horse, on the way to the gallows to be hanged. And what were they doing? Would you believe they were arguing about who was going to sit on the right-hand side of the cart? with no more concern or seriousness than maybe kids today might argue about who gets to sit in the front seat of the car. Now in the Bible reading today, we learn two supremely important truths about how to actually deal seriously and proactively with physical death, unlike those English criminals. Now this Bible passage has got some truths about eternal life, so spiritual life after death, and we ought to consider these things seriously. So a couple of things I just want to share with you today. The first is this. There are actually only two groups of people, those who have eternal life and those who don't. Remember, this is Jesus. This is God's son speaking in the passage that John's just read to us. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes God who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but is passed out of death into life. So clearly Jesus' statement shows these two groups of people, those that are either spiritually dead or those spiritually alive. So there's no fence sitter category. It's one or the other. What distinguishes these two groups? Well, the difference is that those who are spiritually alive have actually heard Jesus' words and believe that God sent Jesus to die on a cross in their place to give them eternal life. They've heard that, they've believed that, Whereas those who are spiritually dead have either not heard it or chosen not to believe it when they have heard it. So here, Jesus is saying he's actually a spiritually life-giving outlet. And by way of an illustration, they're not two random pictures there. Those two bodies of water are in the land where Jesus lived. One is the Sea of Galilee, the one on the right. Uh, the other is um, the Dead Sea. Now, the Sea of Galilee is a beautiful lake filled with life and it's surrounded by lush foliage. So it's, it's alive with life. The other body of water, the Dead Sea, aptly named, uh, has a salt content of about 30%. It makes it 10 times saltier than the oceans of the world. There are no plants of any kind around the water's edge. There's no living creature in the Dead Sea. It's clinically dead. Now, both the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea are fed by the Jordan River, a famous river in, in Israel. There's really only one difference between those two bodies of water because they're both fed by the same river. One thing that causes the Sea of Galilee to be alive and the Dead Sea to be dead, it's this. The Sea of Galilee has a life-giving outlet. The Dead Sea does not. So the Dead Sea is stagnant. It's clinically dead. And this passage today that John read to us tells us, aptly from the book of John, uh, the passage tells us that the life-giving outlet is Jesus Christ. He is the way to eternal life. If you want to be alive, you need Jesus in your life. Without Jesus, we are stagnant and we're spiritually dead. It's as simple as that. Can't make it any more clear. And let me say that Mari was spiritually alive. She heard that message. And she believed that message. And I reckon she'd want you to hear it and believe it as well. Second thing I want to draw from this passage is this. 
Jesus is the only one powerful enough to give eternal life. No one else can do that. Uh, here's, a, here's a little summary of, of a couple of the, ver the verses there that were read to us. God the Father has the power to give life and he has given that power to his son who is Jesus. Now what does that mean? It means that Jesus has the power uh, over physical life. He has the power to give eternal life and, and that's actually evidence. I, I could just say that, uh, but it's actually evidenced by um, an amazing thing that happened. So this is a testimony. It's historically verified. Uh, a bloke called Lazarus. Now, Lazarus uh, died, okay? He was a close friend of Jesus. He died and he'd been laid to rest, like in a tomb, like a cave, for about four days. And then Jesus comes to the scene. He comes to the grieving family. And he incredibly, it's, it's like a believe it or not situation. You either believe it or you don't. Uh, incredibly, Jesus turns up and he commands Lazarus to come out of the tomb. And he does. So it's clearly it's a, it's a miracle. And it points to the truth that Jesus has the power to actually give life. Jesus has the power to save us from death. Mary believed that. Now, a man was once unsure, if anyone here today is uh, unsure about their salvation or about Jesus' claims over death, uh, this, this unsure man, he came to a very famous minister, a famous preacher guy, a guy called D.L. Moody, and he said this. He, he said he was, he was worried because he didn't feel like he had been saved from death. And Moody asked him this. He said this. Um, he says, again, those aren't random pictures. Was Noah safe in the ark? Of course he was, the man replied. Well, what made the man safe? Was it his feeling or was it the ark? And likewise, our salvation doesn't rest on just what we feel. It rests on Jesus Christ, the Saviour, who is the ark. If we've heard and believed and repented of our sin and put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are saved and we have eternal life. And just in conclusion, verse 24 again, it's a pretty powerful verse. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. Now, that's not just some statement of fact. It's actually an invitation to hear the words of Jesus and believe the words of Jesus. And I reckon Mari would want you to have this question posed. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Mari did. And I can tell you she passed away with a peace, a peace of knowing Jesus I've been with many, many people when they've passed away, and I can tell you, you cannot fake eternal peace. But Mari had eternal peace. When she passed away, she had that peace because she knew she was spiritually alive and she would have eternal life with Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sort of wind up the service now, and we're going to um, watch and listen to a final video, this is another of Mari's favourite tunes. Again, many of you will know this song. It's a beautiful hymn, How Great Thou Art. And once again, I encourage you to sit back and to reflect uh, on the many great things. There are many great things that God has done for us. And again, if you know this song, feel free to hum along, sing along. After this, we'll close the service. Here we go, How Great Thou Art.
send off I leave you with the words the beautiful words that come from the Bible the New Testament book 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2 grace mercy and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord now the family extends an invite to you all to join them in in this hall just over here uh, for food and drinks immediately after we've said our final farewells outside now, in a moment, we're going to have the procession out of the building. Uh, and of course, the pallbearers, uh, I think it's, I think, uh, Don Bowling, Ray Donovan, Bill Bennett and Robert Bennett are going to accompany the casket. The family are going to go with the casket, respectfully followed by friends. But the casket's actually going to leave by the back door, the door that it came in. And then it's going to be brought around the side of the building and round to the front of the building. So anyone that wants to form a guard of honour especially the Grafton Nursing Home staff, once you're outside, if you can please line the footpath. So from about there, sort of along to uh, where the road is, where the hearse will be waiting. Now, once the casket actually gets to the hearse, there's going to be a final committal. Uh, seen as Mari's going to be cremated, there isn't going to be a grave, graveside committal. And family friend, uh, Jim Furs, is going to lead the final committal when we get out to the hearse. Now, will the pallbearers please come forward and will everyone else please stand for the procession, which is one of Mari and Rex's favourites, just a closer walk with thee.
right.